Thank you. Hey, man, it's Friday morning. Let's hear it for Friday morning. Another one down. And what, we're going to have like a 75, 80 degree weekend, baseball, golf, hanging out, margaritas, whatever. I mean, you know, that's all right. This is the way I usually get the slots that come either right after lunch or right before everyone's going home. So I think you probably are fresh and ready to roll for this, uh, the weekend, correct? Yeah. Uh, and uh, thanks again for the Smoke Lounge for having us here. I love this room. I've never been here before, and red is my favorite color. I've never seen it, and I almost w wore nothing but a red jumpsuit today, so I'm glad I didn't. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, real quick, and I'll, I'll, I'll fill you in a little bit more about who we are and what we do a little bit later in my story, but just a little bit about me, real quick. Grew up in the Seattle area. I uh, came down here with a buddy in 1985 to play golf and drink beer for a month, and I'm still here. So I uh, met my wife three kids later. They're all off and running now in different pursuits, mostly, mostly creative pursuits, which is pretty fun. And I've uh, ha had an agency here, Park & Co., since 1995. Um, you know, worked for several different agencies before that. I've done everything, and usually small agencies, from account executive to writer to creative director to media buyer to attorney to you name it. And I have no law, law degree, but I've done a little bit of everything. So um, enough about me, a little bit about you all. So this is a creative community, correct? Let me go through. How many artists do we have in the room that, that art for a profession? All right, writers and agency people, great, and everybody else. What else do you do in the creative world? Design. Design, artist, designer. Sustainable design, actually. Sustainable design. Graphic design, Graphic design. great. Architecture. Architecture, awesome. Any, anybody else in some really weird, crazy, like, produce B movies for the sustainability sector, specifically in Northern Arizona or anything like that? <laughs> well. Welcome and thank you very much for having me. Our firm, um, when we started in, you know, back in 95, didn't mean to, but we started doing a lot of work in the environmental area. And I grew up in the Pacific Northwest, one of seven kids, depression era father. Uh, this is one of seven kids in nine years. So you can imagine this, you know, the scraps that we would get into to get our fair attention, to get our fair share for new tennis shoes. Even at the dinner table, my father had one rule, and he said he had to keep one foot on the floor. Everything else went. So it was kind of his way of instilling hard work um, in ourselves, authenticity, honesty, that sort of thing. But when I got down here, we started uh, doing work in our, our, our real big campaign. It was the Water Use It Wisely campaign that started in 1998, and it grew. And I'll show you a little bit about that. But as we progressed as an agency, we got more and more, with the, and the success of the campaign, we got more and more involved with uh, environmental programs and cause marketing. Goodwill of Central Arizona has been a client of ours for 10 years. Um, and and I, I'm the board chair for Social Venture Partners of Arizona, which takes a venture capital approach to philanthropy. It's always been kind of at the heart of our agency is to do more with less, to reuse, but when you are trying to do things, you know, leading with your heart in the nonprofit realm, in, in social justice realm, cause marketing, you have to get really, really inventive about how you stay in business doing that. So business models are really, really important um, and plays into what we're talking about today. You know, reuse across the spectrum of creativity can be everything from what you're using for palettes and for reusing materials for design and so forth for sculptures or it's in repurposing campaigns or creating campaigns into products that can be used throughout the country and get advertisers and marketers using it at a fraction of the, the, the dollars of having to try to create something new. So those are some of the themes that we'll explore today. But the overarching theme and what we've really been doing a lot of work on uh, with over the past seven years is storytelling. So with that, we're gonna be talking about storytelling, how you use it um, in advertising and marketing in particular. And as we say, borrowing from Dr. Seuss, how you use, can use story to nudge the world in any direction you choose. It's really, really powerful. And it's not an art form. I believe that marketers and advertisers, clients and artists pay enough attention to. So we're gonna show you this and we're gonna give you uh, 10 steps on how you can use story in everything you do moving forward. So, and feel free to ask any questions as we move along. Now, how come, I've got a question, Apple makes such beautiful products, but they can't make a remote that's worth a crap. <laughs> Does anyone know of an Apple remote that's worth any good? All right, 
So when uh, I was talking to Jess about this, and I thought, you know, what would be really fun is actually resurrect a very short presentation I did about a year ago. One of the things that drives me the craziest in sustainability and green marketing are the cliches, and they're everywhere. And what's probably the, the mother of all cliches is got anything. You see this everywhere. I mean, I was driving down the road and I saw a got attorney bumper sticker. I'm like, give me a break. So this is my theme here for this quick, you know, how not to reuse something, entire old cliched ideas, as you are thinking about sustainability in all of your creative efforts. So I've got 10 rules to live by. Rule number one, re resist putting the word green in your name unless you have the cojones of Greenpeace to back it up. <laughs> I mean, green this, green that, green living, green burger, green wine. I mean, it just doesn't mean anything. It's ubiquitous, it's everywhere. So, you know, don't tell us how green you are, show us how green you are. Number two, green leafy logos are in their autumn. I mean, how many of you have got clients that are now like green and they want to put a green logo or a green leaf on their logo? I, su I suggest it camouflages the brand whenever you put a green anything on your logo. The do not, number three, do not rely on the recycling logo unless you actually have a concept. So the recycling logos, I just simply Googled, pulled them off, and you know, these things are flying all over the place. It is, of course, a ubiquitous logo with saying, hey, reuse but it is so trite and so relied on, unless you've got a product like Global Water has when they were coming in and were changing the paradigm in water utility use of, of water use and recycle, and actually can use the recycling lo logo to communicate an idea in a novel way, in an unexpected way, then don't use the recycling logo unless you've got it on the back of a beer can that you can actually recycle. Rule number four, you don't need planet Earth in your ad. How many of you have seen that when you open up any of these publications and someone's green, so they gotta have planet Earth in there, just to let you know they're talking about the one and only planet we live on. Very trite, but here's some fun ways, some other uses of, of, of visuals and get the thought process going and storytelling that doesn't spell everything out to the viewer, but gets the viewer, gets them thinking and allow them to connect the dots to make your points. Rule number five, don't tell us how you're being green, show us. You know, when restaurants got the ban on them for you couldn't smoke inside restaurants, a number of them came out and started promoting the benefit of a smoke-free restaurant. Well, the fact of the matter is that's BS because everybody's a smoke-free restaurant at that point. So it's not about just complying with the masses and saying you're green, but show us what you're actually doing. Number six, don't rely on green grass, blue skies, and clouds to tell your sustainability story. Again, how many websites do you go to and they look exactly the same, like a stroll in the park, maybe minus the dog do, you don't have to step in. They all look exactly the same. This was a program that we put together for a local company that trains fleet drivers. And one of their f first big clients was Coca-Cola and training 60,000 of their fleet drivers. What we knew going in is that this was a very uh, ecological campaign. It was about training these fleet drivers how to drive more sensitively of all things, if you can imagine. But it's been proven in Europe where fleets have seen as much as 20 to 25% fuel reduction when they followed these basic behavior uh, changes behind the wheel. Coca-Cola only was looking for a 3% change, and 3% meant something to the tune of like $30 million in fuel over the course of a year for, for Coke. Uh, they instituted the program, and within three months, they had already realized a 6% change. That's how powerful it was. But in the messaging, we couldn't just come through and show what you would expect in an ec ecological campaign, because these are all very independent, Republican, non-Obama drivers. So we had to appeal to what they cared about. We had to give them a story of competition, of the story that says when you learn to be a more effective driver, you reduce the US's requirement for foreign oil. So they're very, you know, played to that very American spirit. We played to their competitive spirit. We would pit driver against driver. Who could save the most that, that week or that month? We would pit division against division, and they were phenomenally successful. But this is how we found that you communicate an, an ecological, a very green program to an audience that isn't typically really receptive to these types of programs. But you gotta tell the story from their point of view. Next up, this is one of the most amazing ones. Did you know you can use all natural in anything? 
you can use that tagline in whatever you want. That modifier, there's nothing that regulates you from using all natural. So don't use it because the trouble is, so there are so many things that aren't all natural that say they're all natural. Find other ways to tell the story about the, the, the all natural nature of your product. Green fogging, I call it. And that is when you start using the word green, not only in your name, but in everything else, and you hear it green, 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 green. It's passe. It do just doesn't work anymore. And a lot of marketers and a lot of advertisers still don't understand that. They think if you put the green moniker on something, you're done. And that's all you have to do. The consumers are way beyond that now. It goes back to what you're doing and the stories you're telling from their standpoint. Method does a beautiful job of it. In this case, rule number nine, don't adopt children and flowers to sell your product. Great products sell products. So Greenworks came out you know, from Clorox, and they really had a nice run for a while. Um, and they had the daisy and uh, the grass and the blue skies. They were you know, really one of the first to market, so they could own that for a while until it got passe. But then their market share dropped off quite a bit as people started doing some more digging into the product and the expense of it and so forth. Method, on the other hand, just came out and said, listen, we are truly going to bring you an all-natural organic product. We're going to give it really cool happening design. We're going to give it colors that actually you're, are going to appeal to you. And oh, by the way, it's green and sustainable and does all that other thing. <coughs> but it's a, it's a fabulous product, and they do a great job of marketing it. Rule number 10, only organic design and typefaces work with organic products. So, you know, cozy chamomile, uh, what is this typeface, papyrus? Have you noticed that is the default typeface for anything green? So if you want to leave here today and make some money designing a logo for a green company, put, a plant, or put the planet in it, put a leaf on it, say, call them green something, and be sure you use the papyrus typeface because that's pretty much universal for all things green. Uh, and extra credit. If it's an environmental object coming out of cupped hands or a non sequitur item, don't use it. I mean, how, how often is this done? I was going to show it. I don't have it here. Um, but if you get a chance, who, who's familiar with Tom's of Maine? Great product, right? And they've been around a long time. They got a legacy of organic, all natural, really a great company. Well, they came out with their sustainability report earlier this week online. And it's, they called it their goodness report, which is really cool. But it has every cliche you could possibly imagine in it. And then they have these sort of Gestapo lines that's, that, that are surprising because they're incongruous with the brand. They have one that says, we allow our employees to spend 5% of their time in nonprofits. We allow. And you find this stuff throughout this whole sustainability report, their version of a goodness report. And all I can say is why or how could they make such a mistake in that when they have such a legacy of telling the truth and being authentic about their product is I think they're going through the motions and I think the customers see it. They may not look at it as, with as such a critical eye as I do or as we might in the creative communications business, but it's there subconsciously they see it and subconsciously they get some cognitive dissonance and they're like, what the hell? And I'll show you why that is. In fact, I'm gonna do a test on you here in a little bit and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. Next up, I wanna show you, it's a two minute trailer of one of the best movies I have seen in the well, past several years. It's a movie called Finding Joe, and it's about, it's created from the Joseph Campbell Foundation. How many of you are, are familiar with Joseph Campbell? Great American mythologist, um, studied mythology over time. He passed away in 1987. And Joseph found uh, this, this pattern in all stories, patterns that date back to the very beginning of time, patterns that Aristotle used. Shakespeare used, that we use today. J.J. Uh, Abrams that uses it all the time. You will see this pattern in all great stories, in all great songs, in all great movies, because it's the pattern that we all live, day in and day out. We recognize this pattern. So this movie, Finding Joe, and I highly recommend you watching it. You can get it on you know, Netflix. Uh, I believe it's on Netflix. I saw it on, on Apple TV and whatever. But when you see this trailer, you'll see what I mean. There's three la layers to it. And what I want you to think about when you watch this movie is how does it impact you on your own hero's journey, your own personal hero's journey? Number two, what are the personal hero's journeys of your customers, of the people you are trying to connect with and talk to? And then number three, what is the hero's journeys of the brands and the clients and the people that you work with as their storytellers, be it uh, you know, in writing, producing, designing? 
Um, what is their hero's journey and how can you be an expert at linking those three together? Because when you did, it is remarkably powerful. Or when you do, it is remarkably powerful. So let me show you this. The most important thing that myths teach us is to go beyond the limits of our possibility. Joseph Campbell was one of the leading mythology experts of all time. He diagrammed all of our stories. He find this one story within all the stories that we can relate to no matter where you come from. And he called it the hero's journey. All the heroes, all the villains, they're all in there because they're all in here. This is where they come from. In other words, we're not separate from the characters we see in our movies and in our novels. They are us, it's one journey. If this path to the hero's journey is fairly simple, why then is it that everybody isn't living it? It's very difficult for a person with the media, with advertising, there's no creativity. You end up on that treadmill and you can't get off. We are each our own greatest inhibitors. The one thing that keeps people small is their fears, or as Campbell says, it's their dragons. It's a beast, it's a monster. I'll never forget seeing the ramp and this wave of fear just crashed over me. It's going from an unsatisfying life to a satisfying life by pushing through the scariest things you can imagine. I think people wake up to the fact that they're the hero of their own life when they get tired of being the victim of it. This idea that our greatest selves are still hidden and that what we do with our lives is what makes us heroes. Once I saw what was possible with a skateboard in your hand, I had to keep going. I mean, I just wanted to fly. This is it. This is what happens when we follow our bliss. Magical things happen that we couldn't have imagined. Do something that gives you that moment. But if you can do that, then you can achieve the impossible. The great obstacle for most of us is ourselves. If we can overcome that basic fear, in Campbell's terms, we can all be heroes. It's a really, really an incredible movie. And if you think about yourself, I mean, why are you here today? Why did you take the time out of your morning when you could have had you know, a little bit more lazy morning? Believe me, I, like, I look for those all the time. But you're on your own journey and you're here to try to better yourself, to meet more people, to help expand your horizons. And we forget that. I don't know why that is, but it gets coached out of us. The fact that we're all innate storytellers and we just don't pay enough attention to the stories that we're leading and the stories that are going on around us. We get taught to sell people stuff and we got to stop selling and just start telling. Get hooked up in what they're about and make sure that your brands and your customers understand that and they are helping their customers along in their hero's journey. And that's truly what great creative does. So let me show you how we learned to do this. And it wasn't something that we knew. We had to kind of teach ourselves about it. So Park & Co, if you may have seen our building, we're up on uh, Indian School on 41st Street, or 44th Street, don't even remember where I am. Um, just celebrated our 18th year in business. And I've been doing this line of work for almost 30 years. And one of the things about it, um, about seven years ago, our son graduated from Arcadia High and he was always a filmmaker. He made little stop action uh, films of, of Legos. I showed him how to do that as a little kid. When he was in high school, he got a short film in the, Arca or in the Phoenix Film Festival. He went over to Chapman University and studied film, directing, uh, production. He graduated and now he's in Hollywood as a motion graphics artist and he's working with NBC and ESPN and he's only 25 years old. But he's been doing this forever and he's just really driven at it. When he was in school, I asked him to start sending me the books because I was fascinated when he would um, talk about story structure and lighting structure and things that Hollywood was teaching him and his student friends on you know, how to tell great stories because I was really curious from an advertising standpoint why we would create two TV commercials for a campaign. And we loved them both, of course. They're, you know, they're our babies and we have them out there. And one would pull really well and one would pull all right. Or one wouldn't pull at all. Or we would have to pull it, period. And I would look at them and I'd say, you know, the, the, the structure's great. Why is this one not working? So when I started reading, what does Hollywood know that we don't know, um, I started learning about a lot of different writers. Uh, uh, Robert McKee, a famous screenwriting coach, who in fact I was just over with our son for a four day screenwriting seminar in LA with him two weeks ago. My son will be writing the screen uh, play myself. I wanna see how we could use it in communications. 
But I also learned really for the first time about Joseph Campbell and this hero's journey. And the more I looked at, at the hero's journey and the 17 parts of it, the more I realized we were innately doing this. We didn't know it. We just didn't realize it. And we were missing lots of opportunities to make our work even stronger. So that's what brings me here today. I'm going to show you how we did that. Real quick, some of the first work we did in sustainability, I mentioned, is the Water Use It Wisely campaign. People said, don't tell us to save water, but show us how. They were inviting us into their story. They were saying, don't come in and just you know, cram a bunch of information down our necks, but tell us and show us ways that we can get involved and be very proactive at it. We started the program in Mesa in 1998. It's still running today. Uh, we own the campaign. We did a joint venture with the city of Mesa and said, listen, if you allow us to own the campaign and we can resell it on a national basis, we will match you dollar for dollar in creative fees and build a, a, a national caliber campaign that you can't afford it on your own. And they loved it because we quickly got Phoenix on board, the state of Arizona on board, and it's grown over 400 private and public entities throughout North America. I mean, even the U.S. government hired us to go over to um, the Turkish Cypriot on the island of Cyprus, and I spent a week teaching the Turks how to put together a water conservation campaign. Had no idea that my personal journey or story would lead there, but it was so cool because we built a program with that reuse in mind, knowing that there were budgets all across the country that needed water conservation, you know, utilities, but had no budgets to do it. But if we built a strong enough universal message that we could get them to purchase and run the program, and we essentially built a national brand of water conservation around little tiny budgets all around the country, and did them a favor because they were able to buy a campaign that was worth 30 times what they could possibly pay for. Um, Lowe's got involved. It's been written up in several textbooks. And again, this is nothing that we, we knew was going, going to happen. We just felt like there was a model here and we needed a good story around it. And it has taken on a life of its own. We do work with Resolution Copper Mining. We just launched a new website for them. And we wanted it to be sort of the discovery channel of copper mining. So when you go there, you really learn about how copper is mined, what they do with it. And in Resolution's um, case, we're working with them to help get a land exchange done because there is an enormous copper deposit up out of Superior that can supply, America's, uh, with a, uh, can supply America with 20% of its copper needs for the next 60 years. Now, what we don't like about copper mining, any of us, is the big strip mining. And copper mines know that technology has gotten to the point of they will go in and use block, uh, uh, block mining where they go down and they actually tunnel underneath the core, uh, the deposit, about a, a mile and a half and pull underneath it. And over the years, you get some subsidence, but nothing to, in the case of, of, of uh, strip mining. So uh, really a fun program working with them and we help them with their environmental story about how um, they can be as environmentally sensitive as possible in the mining of copper. Um, we already showed you, talked a little bit, little bit about this program. But our work led to other things uh, with Water Use It Wisely. The county called us and said, hey, we want to do something similar with clean air. But they didn't want to just run ads. So we found some other ways to tell their story. And in this case, we ended up putting a three-story dust mask on the side of the Superior Court building in downtown Phoenix. We kind of had a bet inside of whether or not they would really let us do it, but we won. And it you know, hung up there for a year. It was the ba main basic iconic visual or metaphor for the entire campaign. And the idea is you would see this coming and going. So when you did see it in other places on billboards and in, in collateral pieces on website, that you would have that automatic connection of, Bad air, what can I do to help? Quick story to be told. Metro Light Rail uh, came to us. We helped them with the branding and launching of Metro Light Rail, and then we've handled uh, some of their other campaigns throughout. Well, they came to us and said, hey, we want to do a bunch of posters and let people know of all the cool attractions and amenities along the light rail line, and put in a bunch of pictures and stuff, and we just like, that sounds boring. So what could we do that actually gets the writer or the audience on board and let them connect the dots? And so Luis and our creative team came up with this idea of simply using the construct of a rail map and obviously creating the silhouettes of all the different attractions along the line and allow you to say, hey, this is pretty cool. You know, there are lots of things to do along the Metro Light Rail line. Let me find what I want to do and, and get on board. Couple more here, um, Expect More Arizona, a very large educational push here in Arizona. We launched this website a month ago and it's a campaign called the Excellence Tours. And what we wanted to do is get people that sh uh, around Arizona to share their very positive stories of what's happening within their schools. 
you know, you pick up a paper anymore and you just know how Arizona is, you know, trailing the country in about every possible educational sector. And you hear it over and over again, and it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So we wanted to create a site where people can share gains. Here's what we're doing in, in little ways that it can make a big difference. So you would shoot a one minute video from your school, you would upload it, it would go to the site. We use Google Maps to highlight where, you know, what videos are coming from what part of the state. Um, and we put the call to action out, you know, please share your story, shoot it, set it up, doesn't have to be professionally produced, just have fun with it. We're gonna give you a podium in which to share your story. They, we were hoping we'd get like 30 videos uploaded. We would hope we'd get 100,000 views or something in the first 30 days. Well, when I looked yesterday, we had 195 videos uploaded, which tells you something about the activism, the personal activism of this state of people that are really doing things about education. And as of yesterday, we had over almost 600,000 thumbs up, 166,000 views and so forth. We had almost a half a million votes. I mean, the thing just took off. It, it, it took off way more than we even anticipated it would. And what we found is that people were just hungry. They just wanted to share their stories of all the great things that were happening at their schools, but nobody gave them a place to tell it. That's all they did. Very, very fun program. Um, in the form of storytelling, we've, we've done this. I don't know if any of you have been the benefactors of a free cup of coffee on Park & Co where uh, we go to a, a local coffee shop, give them $250 on a card, and we just say, everybody that walks through the door, give them a free cup of coffee, and all we ask is you give them a card that says, you just received a random act of Park & Co. Please pay it forward. Any idea is just to get you know, our message out in the market, but let them know, hey, we're here, we're good citizens, we're friendly neighbors. If you wanna know more about us, there's a website on the back, but that's as far as we go to selling. We'd much rather be a part of their story than just trying to sell them something. And it's, it's been really fun, and we have gotten the attention of folks like uh, Donate Life Arizona. They had a cup of coffee and they said, you know what, we gotta do something like this to get more organ donors interested in you know, getting in, involved in this process, so we created one of the very first organ donation apps on Facebook. And it's a really fun one because you can go in there and like I can give my kidney to one of my, or a liver to one of my drinking buddies, you know, or my heart to my wife or whatever. And it gets shared throughout Facebook. And it's really to do nothing more than to draw attention to and ask the question is, are you an organ donor? Now I gotta ask you this question because I learned this in the process. Do you know what one of the greatest obstacles is for people to become organ donors in their minds? I'm talking about telling people's stories. Yes? I think they're afraid that if they're critically injured that they'll like kill them to the organ or they won't work to save their life. That's one of them. That's one of them, but there's even a more interesting one than that because that's very rational thinking. And, and emotional, but very rational, like, oh my goodness, if I go down, they're not gonna save me because my organs are worth more, which, by the way, they don't do. They will actually try to save you. <laughs> but it, what's that? To say that your organs aren't good enough. <laughs> People think that too, yeah, absolutely. They think, oh my God, you know, I've been a drinker all my life. They couldn't take it, or, or um, you know, I'm overweight, so my body can't be good for anybody. That's a really good point. But believe it or not, one of the biggest obstacles is karma. People think when I check that, what I'm doing is just checking off something that says take me because you gotta have my, my organs. Isn't that an interesting thing? It's just, it's that subconscious coming in and saying, whoa, 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 you know, we don't wanna get too far out there because they might actually come and do it. Something might happen to you. We just launched this site this week and it allows you to go on and it's a virtual wall where you can go and put your name on the wall. You don't even have to be an organ donor. You just said, I believe in organ donations to help people live on. And this is at liveonaz.org. But when you get in here, you see the stories of those that have received organs. You hear the stories of those that have donated organs. Um, and you just, you, you get involved in the whole story around the process versus just being asked to give, you really understand the human side of it and what it's all about. Very fun site, just got up. If you get a chance, go to it, check it out, uh, put your name on the wall. Uh, believe me, it's good karma, not bad karma. And you don't even have to be an organ donor, but of course the whole bottom line to this thing is, it's about organ donation. So, a little bit about me, a little bit about us, a little example, some examples of the stories that we tell. Let me now show you, this is always a fun part of the program, why storytelling works on our brains, whether we like it or not. And by the way, how we were all innate storytellers as kids, and unfortunately it gets educated and coached out of us. And so now we're trying to bring that back in. 
The human mind yields helplessly to the section of story. If you want to read a great book about how story works on us, read The Storytelling Animal by Jonathan Gottschall. One of the best books I've ever read. Really a fun read, very interesting. And this example I'm going to show you next came from that book. I'm going to show you, and this is going to demonstrate to you why story works, then I'll show you how you can pragmatically use it. In a moment, I'm going to show you a one-minute video. It was produced in 1946. It was the first time this study was done, and this study has been done over and over and over again. It's very rudimentary, very crude, you know, when you compare it to our, our terms you know, today in creative production. There's no audio to it. There's just something happening on the screen. And when it's all said and done, we're going to open it up, and I want to ask, I want to see what you saw. I want to hear what you saw. Are you ready? So, kind of a crazy piece. All right, so what did you see? I didn't like you didn't like it? No. Did it make you feel like creepy? Um, I, I felt bullied. You felt bullied? Yeah. yeah. Like the big triangle was bullying you? Yeah. yeah. That's interesting, an emotional response. Cool. Yeah. But I also thought it was interesting how the like, piece, the big triangle, went after the little triangle first, and then the little sub, you know, the little character ended up kind of thriving around and mm -hmm. then the same size and the same size came together in the end and persevered. So you felt like the little triangle might be the protagonist in this whole thing and he's up against the bully and is, is, that, is that what you're saying? kind of floating around like I don't really know what to do right now but okay <laughs> I can be useful right here and then yeah. they got together and then they got really happy about it and then the big guy got really angry and just destroyed this whole world. That's awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. It, it, it felt to me like a domestic violence situation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we hear that a lot. Someone back here? Well, about halfway through, all of a sudden I thought, oh, it's like a game of tag. Cool. I haven't heard tag. That's cool. One more? I got that the two little shapes were, you know, they knew this big bully was in there and they decided to go make fun of them yeah. together. So they played off of that and uh, took, took turns having fun yeah. running around hiding from them. So it feels like it's an aggressive story. It feels like, you know, an underdog is pitted against someone much bigger and more able and somehow they come through, right? I mean, we hear this a lot. We hear about domestic violence. We hear people say, this makes me nervous. Um, I had one lady say, it's Romeo and Juliet. And then the guy sitting right next to her said, you know what it is, to me, it's a sperm trying to impregnate an egg. <laughs> And when I told that to our creative director, he says, oh, great, now you're taking the audience from Shakespeare's to Porky's in one fell swoop, right? So, but what's interesting about this is when you stop and say, what are you really seeing um, you know, rationally? You're not seeing anything. You're just seeing geometric shapes floating around a screen. And of course, it's edited to manipulate you a little bit. But in reality, there's nothing going on. There's no character. There's no people. There are no faces. There are, there's no audio. But do you see how your brain had to knit together meaning? Because you're looking at this abstract thing going, what the hell is this? Why would he be showing this to me? So your brain fights, 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 fights for meaning. And the reason being is your brain has one and only one job, and that is survival of your being. And when you study this, it's really, really fascinating. I didn't, re I didn't realize how deeply rooted that survival instinct is. 
but it is constantly scanning the room. Even right now, I am scanning the room and my brain is saying, yeah, it looks like, yeah, these are nice people. No one's gonna try to kill you, you should be okay. But if a big thug walked in the back door, I guarantee you my brain would go, what the hell, who's that, and what are they, or what are they here for? Robert McKee at the storytelling uh, seminar said that great writers and great directors and great cinematographers really understand this tremendous human dynamic of the internal stasis that our bodies require. They say your protagonist, your body will do as little as it possibly has to to gain the greatest reward. Because when it tries to reach out and change something in its environment, it's an attack on its survival. Does that make sense? So the brain is just saying, don't do it, don't do it, just sit right here. If you don't do anything, I'm happy with this because it's the easiest way, way for me to ensure the survival of your being. So you've got this inside stasis, but on our, in our external environment, outside, it is constantly changing. The weather constantly changes. Our environment, our business environments constantly change. Our needs constantly change. Um, and so on the outside, we have to be in constant evolution for survival, which fights this constant narrative internally for stasis. And therefore, it goes back to the brain constantly scanning and trying to understand the story you're telling it. So imagine how this works with like a really horribly designed logo and you inherit that and you're brought in and you're saying, you know, the first thing you gotta do is change this logo. And, a, and the client says, well, you know, my wife or my husband designed it and we really like it and what's wrong with it? We've had it for 15 years. But you know, that little symbology says so much about the company and it's so hard to get that across to a company. If they're showing you a really awful PowerPoint loaded with slides full of bullet points and graphs and charts and you just go, uh, your brain, the story kicks off in it and your brain just says, you know what, I'm not gonna pay attention, I'm just gonna let the subconscious put together a bunch of meaning here and typically that meaning is inaccurate. So that's why as marketers and, and professional storytellers across the board, we have to understand this and just simply tap into the innate storyteller within us to, do, to help our clients through. So again, this is not something I knew right away. It's something that after studying it um, from Chapman University and then really diving headlong into it through screenwriting workshops and others and, and reading how the brain works, that I realized that, here, that Joseph Campbell's Hero's Journey, the 17 steps that you see right here, that basically is the universal pattern for how we live our lives and all the great stories that we, um, that we relate to is the pattern that we as us professional communicators can use every time we are asked to help a customer or a client communicate to their customer. If you wanna do something fun is this weekend, after you've watched Finding Joe, grab a beer or the beverage of your choice, watch Star Wars, the very first Star Wars, because George Lucas did nothing but when he was at USC, he studied Joseph Campbell. He took the 17 beats to the hero's journey and he wrote the script exactly to it. Um, and it's really fun and you know the power of Star Wars, but when you sit down and you have this in front of you and you start watching that, you will can completely dissect that first movie. And it's so hugely universally powerful precisely because of this. Well, when we started applying this to our work, we realized, you know, 17 steps, there were some nuances in there that just didn't really work and weren't really needed in what we are trying to do. So here we take it from, and I wanna show you real quickly how you can take the emotional right brain side of storytelling and Joseph Campbell's hero's journey and apply it to the intellect of the marketer and what we're all taught in marketing. So backstory and setting, every great story, you know, has to give you a backstory and let you know where your protagonist is, is operating from. Well, that's nothing more than defining the position in the marketplace for your clients. So when you do that, instead of going through and, and taking them through the mechanics of it, just ask them to tell you their story from the human standpoint, not the, not the business person standpoint. You get into the hero of the story and I guarantee you, they will all say, well, we're the hero. And you say, no, you're not the hero. Your customer is their hero. You are the mentor, the sidekick. You are the Obi-Wan Kenobi that is going to help the customer in their hero's journey. Um, so you wanna talk about that customer. You wanna write personas. You wanna do basically a character study on that customer. And as Robert McKee would say, you have to know them in a godlike way. You have to know that customer better than they know themselves. When you get into the stakes and goals is what ultimately does your customer want? What are they trying to achieve and how does your product or service help them to that end? 
And then it, because you're living in a parallel universe with your brand in your brand's hero's journey, is now you start overlaying what are the goals of your brand? What do they want? You know, what do you want to grow on? And how do you make those work together? The inciting incident um, is about what turns the world upside down. You know, every great story. Luke comes back on his island or his planet of Tatooine and he finds that his aunt and uncle have been killed. And so his life as he knows it is done. And he is then propelled in this very extraordinary world with the first stop at that crazy bar. And of course, he goes on to defeat the, uh, the Darth Vader and the, you know, the black forces of the universe and so forth. But everybody has an inciting, uni uh, an inciting incident in their life. In your customers, it may be something they're trying to overcome. Or it might even be an inciting incident that your brand puts into their life. Something that is going to make a change in their life, but they have to have the guts to uh, embrace it. This is called tension and disruption in advertising and marketing. What are you doing out there that's different and more interesting and better than anybody else? For the sake of time, I won't go through this whole thing because we're going to talk about it a little bit in your workbook. But you can see how when boiled down, the hero's journey, when you apply it to communications brand strategy, it works. When you combine it, apply it then to the communications plan brand and strategy, it works. And then when you apply it to the actual tactical execution of that plan, it works on every single product that you put out that, to help tell their story. Yes, five more, okay. So let me, we've got five minutes here. We're gonna make this very, very quick. Story in three acts, a beginning, a middle, and an end. And as basic as that sound, it's amazing at how, how often we forget that. So I'm gonna give you the analogy of making a cup of coffee. In this case, our protagonist is a coffee bean. Smells good, feels good in your hands. It might be the Sumatra blend. It could be Pike's Place Rose, whatever. By itself, it doesn't do much for you other than it's kind of pleasant to have around, whatever. But what do you do? You put it through immense conflict. You put it through an inciting incident when you put it in the grinder. You grind a hell out of it. Then you put it in a pot and you, boil, you know, pour boiling water over the top of it. Then you take it out of the pot and you put it in a cup and it's thinking, oh, I've been transformed, this is awesome. And you hit it one more time with that <laughs> steaming hot you know, cream and what do you get out of the whole process? Is you have transformed your protagonist into a delicious cup of coffee. Every great story does this same thing, and every great brand should do this for their customers. So when you think about it and you're telling that story, think about the conflict that you're in. Do not ignore the conflict, but embrace the conflict, because the more conflict your customer is in, and the more conflict your brand actually has to go through to help them achieve their success, the stronger the brand interaction and the, and the greater the evangelist you are gonna build for that brand. So I'm gonna show you real quick, and you can do this without me, but you all got the storytelling books there? You can make notes in it. We've got a couple of extra here. So if you write all over that and you wanna take them home, I'm telling you, you can use this process for anything. For yourself, for career development, to talk your kid into eating their peas, to getting a customer to create a new logo if that's what they need, to your overall brand strategy and so forth. And what I want you to do in this case for, the, for just to get your, your mind in this section, I want, to think, I want you to think about a customer right now. Someone, and maybe this isn't a client of yours, but it's their customer. How well do you know their customer? And in this case, I ask, just start with three things. What are the three main keys to that customer that helps you start understanding the persona of the person you're talking to? The next up, what's at stake? What is it that that customer wants? And you know, quite often it's not the product itself, it's what the product does for them. So what emotionally does that customer want to achieve? And how is your brand gonna help them get there? The more specific you can be, the better. The inciting incident. What in their life has changed that has either got, has them out now pursuing something new that your customer, your client might deliver to them, or is it something that your client needs to communicate to them to help them change their lives and say, you know, this is maybe a better path for me to take and this particular product or service is going to help me get there faster. But describe that. What is it that's turning that world upside down? Because again, if the world doesn't get turned upside down, then we're talking to the internal stasis of our being. And that is the being that doesn't want to do anything. And that being doesn't buy anything. So you've got to make sure that you've got something that's going to turn it, um, that, that, that has that inciting incident for the positive. Of course, then you have antagonists and obstacles. What do they come up against? Is it self-doubt? Is it not enough money, not enough time? Is it a spouse that says you're crazy? What are you thinking? Um, 
Is it just the availability of the product or service? But what is it that the customer has to overcome in order to use and adopt your product? Ah, enter the sidekick of the love story. This is where your, you come in and you work with your client and help them understand their role in this whole uh, process. We do an, an archetype study with all of our brands to help them understand what is the predominant archetype that they reflect in their customer's story and then overlay that with the customer's persona to understand where they fall on this grid of acceptance, of individuality, of risk taking, of non-risk taking. It helps us better match our stories and our genre of our stories with what our customers are really interested in. One of the most fascinating parts of this, and this becomes the third step in act two of the overall hero's journey in this, is um, the story and the journey gets more difficult than it gets better. So for instance, how many of you have really wanted a car, you know, a particular car, and then you go out and buy the damn thing? And then you get home and you wake up the next morning and you think, oh my God, what have I done? You know, <laughs> buyer's remorse, right? Um, we internally have a certain amount of buyer's remorse, whether we recognize it or not. Very, very rarely will we buy a product or service, take it home, use it, and immediately fall in love with it because we'll always be fighting that, gee, should I spend the money? What will people think? You know, I guess I should embrace it subconsciously. So the client needs to understand that the hero's journey with their customer often gets more difficult than, than, than better at first, but it's a great opportunity for brand interaction, for the brand to be there, holding their hands, for the, the Obi-Wan Kenobi to teach the force and how to really use the lightsaber. And it's a great, it's the time for brand interaction. Because as we get into act three, you get success. Now the customer's like, yeah, this is pretty cool. This is great. But it's a, it's a false peak in that they got what they wanted, but in the process, if your brand and you have done the right job on behalf of that brand, they have educated and made that consumer smarter and better about the product or service they're buying. So it starts setting the stage for the next uh, revolution of the hero's journey. I want you to know that this hero's journey is not a closed loop thing. It is a virtuous cycle because you wanna keep building brand, uh, brand evangelists and brand interaction. As we come to the end of our three-part story, um, second to the last is what is the moral of your story? You know, what does the brand really truly stand for? And when you are ever creating the story around that, our brains are going to default of, okay, what is this? Is this good against evil? You know, light against dark? It, gets, it becomes very binary, and the brand has to have a story that resonates on that very basal level of, are these people for real? You know, when I mentioned about uh, Toms of Maine earlier, what troubles me so much about that is the dissonance, the, the disconnect between what their real brand story is and the one that they're just kind of going through the motions. And to me, there's not a brand moral there other than, oh my God, they're not really taking this seriously. So ask yourself in your work, what is the moral of that particular story? And then finally, the to be continued, you know. I mean, what I just saw Skyfall and was at the 23rd Bond movie. You know, Hollywood gets it. Don't go out and invent and find a bunch of new customers every time. Embrace and love the customers you have and take them on then the next revolution of the hero's journey with the brand and how can the brand, you know, be there for you time in and time out. I know I'm almost out, but I wanna show you how you can do this in 30 seconds. This is a TV spot we did for Goodwill of Central Arizona. The hero's journey in 30 seconds. When you choose to donate to Goodwill, not only will your old items find a great new home, you'll be helping put Arizonans to work. Good stuff, good work, goodwill. All right, so who's the hero? The boy. The, boy. the little boy, the little boy that hope all adults can relate to. And what is the, what's the little boy want? What's at stake? The bear. The bear. A good home for the bear. The boy is on his own hero's journey. He's growing up. He doesn't need the bear anymore, but he can't just see throwing the bear away. He wants to find a new home. What's the inciting incident? Where does his old world turn into a new extraordinary world? When he passes the other bear in the bin. When's that? When he passes the other bear in the bin. It's actually a little bit before that. It's his decision to leave the comfort and safety of his home. 
he's gone. He's now out in the street, you know, and he's riding his bike by himself, which most people say, I've never let my kid do that. But most, kid, most people my age said, we did that all the time. We left at, you know, 8 in the morning, and we showed up at 8 at night, and my folks were like, about time. Um, you know, they weren't calling the police and everything out, putting out an Amber Alert for us, but, uh, but it plays to, to our market. So um, what are the obstacles and antagonists that he comes across in this journey? Uh, everybody asks that. Good question. Because subconsciously you would go, ooh, all they do is have crappy stuff at Goodwill. You can't do that because subconscious you go, you mean oh, he's pulling right. junk out of good, yeah, you know. So, but yeah, the obstacles here is all the other places that you as a donator could put your stuff. You could garage sale it, you could throw it away, you could put it in the um, corner bins. Um, by the way, I always take this opportunity because uh, it's really important to let you know the vast majority of the, quarter of the corner bins you see out there, there's like 5,000 of them in the valley, go to for-profit entities in Texas and Florida. The only ones that you can be assured of that keep your items right here if they say Salvation Army on them or Valley Brothers and Big Sisters. The other ones parade as if they're giving their stuff to nonprofits, but it's a complete for-profit operation and it's costing charities and nonprofits here in Arizona uh, over 30 million annually in lost revenue through your inventory that gets put in there and taken across the country and sold in a for-profit environment. So the next time, and the whole point of this spot is, take that little bit of extra effort, take it down to Goodwill or to Salvation Army or to your favorite charity if you know it's gonna stay right there and they're gonna sell it. So one of the main uh, underlying themes of that spot is, is, is take the effort, go, go the distance. So we wrap it up, the success is the boy gets there, there's a nice you know, man there to take his item and we give you one line of copy, one call to action or one moral of the story basically is you can do good with all your old stuff. You know, when you give your items to Goodwill, it helps put people to work. And I don't know, most people don't know their workforce development programs at Goodwill, but they helped over 15,000 people find jobs, not just within Goodwill, but throughout the Valley last year because of where your donations go. Um, one last thing, if I've got 30 more seconds to show you this, let me just show you a couple of the little tricks that we use that most people don't see or recognize, but it helps propel the story forward. So first we start in the dark, underneath the bed, which says dungeon in most people's minds, and the boy is freeing a loved one from a dungeon. Um, you see the quick, very subtle tap, which builds the bond between the boy and the boy who is rescuing his, his uh, teddy bear which gives gravity to his pursuit and journey to go across town. You'll notice the edits pick up, the light picks up, the music picks up to the point the sun comes out and he arrives in a bright sunny um, you know, arms basically of, of someone at Goodwill to help them. We get character arc on a number of different levels from the visual level, from the audio level, and from the character, from the, from the talent level as we arc through this spot. So let me show it to you one more time since you know now, the movie Magic. Releasing him from the dungeon. The little pats. And he's off, inciting incident. Now he's into the scary world. We even throw in some jagged uh, pathways there to challenge him a little bit more. Sun comes when out. When you choose to donate to Goodwill, not only will your old items find a great new home, you'll be helping put Arizonans to work Good stuff, good work, goodwill. So I'll leave you with this from Joseph Campbell. We're not on our journey to save the world, but to save ourselves. And in doing that, you save the world. And this is just my way of saying, as professional communicators and marketers, we have to pay attention to our customers and we have to know them in a godlike way if we are going to do the right work for our clients. And then this is so powerful, you gotta make sure that your clients are delivering. You can tell a great story for them, but it also plays to their hero's journey. And are they delivering operationally quality of the product? Is what you're selling actually something that this, that this customer needs? Or is it something else that's just going to fill up their closets and end up at Goodwill someday? And then I ask you, you know, what's your journey? What journey are you on? Um, and how can you make it richer and more robust just by being more pragmatic, more intentional in watching how your hero's journey unfolds and then helping other people along the way as you do it? That's my story and I'm sticking to it. And I thank you very much for your time today. Thank you.